Interpol is rightly famous as the world's lead agency in the fight against international crime. It is also meant to be impartial, with a constitution that forbids any activity of a political, religious or racial character. But are its famous wanted alerts being abused by some of its member states to target dissidents and political opponents? Sarah Spiller has been to investigate. Police chiefs from around the world meet in Bali, Indonesia. The event, Interpol's 85th General Assembly. This, the opening ceremony. This global organization connects police in 190 member countries, allowing them to cooperate and exchange information in the fight against international crime. The stated role of Interpol, to make the world a safer place. But behind this pomp, this spectacle, Interpol, under its current Secretary General, Jürgen Stock, confronts serious allegations. It's about a crucial crime-fighting tool, an Interpol wanted alert, known as a red notice. Our red notices alert police worldwide to wanted persons reaching every member country over our secure communications network. The charge, Interpol red notices, are open to abuse by some member states to target dissidents and political opponents around the world. And one of the countries which stands so accused is the host of this year's Interpol General Assembly, Indonesia. This is Benny Wender, he now lives in exile from Indonesia, and he's been granted asylum by Britain. Benny's led a campaign for the independence of his native West Papua from Indonesia, which has seen him become an international figure. But in 2011, he found he'd become the subject of an international wanted alert circulated by Interpol. I put my name on, on the Google, and then I find out the red notice. I was shocked. Why this? And I call my, my wife and my children. I never hear this uh, Interpol and red notice. And you are like wanted men. The Interpol red notice accused Benny of crimes involving the use of weapons and explosives. Charges Benny had long insisted were brought by Indonesia in order to silence him. Benny's red notice was deleted after a challenge by a human rights group, Interpol conceding the case against him was predominantly political in nature. A certain country like Indonesia, they also misuse this Interpol uh, rule because they're using this against people like me. So how does Interpol's red notice system work? Our investigation began on Interpol's online database. Any member country can ask Interpol to issue a red notice. Interpol looks at the evidence provided, which can be kept secret. And in the vast majority of cases, Interpol then distributes that notice to its member states as requested. Sometimes, but not always, a red notice is also publicly published on Interpol's website. But there's another kind of wanted alert too. This is called a diffusion, described on the Interpol site as less formal than a red notice, but also used to request the arrest or location of an individual. Diffusion notices are circulated directly by a member country via Interpol systems. According to official figures, in 2015, Interpol issued over 11,000 red notices with over 78,000 diffusion notices in circulation. Most of these are entirely legitimate, but human rights groups are concerned that some are not. Jago Russell is chief executive of the NGO Fair Trials International, which has been calling for reform of Interpol's alert systems. Interpol has been allowing itself uh, to be used by oppressive regimes across the world uh, to export the persecution of human rights defenders, journalists, uh, and political uh, opponents. 
by circulating these global wanted person alerts for them. Every member country has what's called a National Central Bureau, or NCB. And these NCBs can ask Interpol for a wanted alert. Once Interpol circulates a wanted alert, it's up to individual countries to decide whether to act on it or not. And there's no requirement to make any of this public. In fact, you could have no idea what data Interpol may have circulated about you until you turn up at an airport or a border. In Brussels, we met Bahar Kim Yonga. He's a Belgian citizen of Turkish descent. He's also a campaigner over human rights in Turkey. This is Bahar over 16 years ago, in a youthful but heartfelt political protest at the European Parliament, for a cause he's continued to support. I started to, uh, to campaign regarding the situation in, in Turkey. But when we met Bahar, he told us of a disturbing event. In 2006, he was arrested on his way to a concert in the Netherlands. It seemed Turkey had requested an Interpol wanted alert, suggesting links with terrorism. The problem was, when these claims were actually examined by the Dutch authorities, they decided the charges didn't stack up and released him. But then he was arrested in Italy and in Spain because of the Interpol alert, and the same thing happened. On the question of, um, am I a terrorist or not? Of course I'm not a terrorist. Uh, but don't believe me, just look to a uh, European justice decision. And I was freed and acquitted by Dutch tribunal, by an Italian tribunal and by a Spanish tribunal. It took sustained pressure from human rights activists before Interpol confirmed they deleted data about Baha from their systems. The whole experience, he told us, had taken a toll on his family. I mean, I'm, I'm a victim of a, of a mechanism. European authorities know very well that I'm not dangerous. Turkey had one single tool in order to um, crash me. It was Interpol. But Turkey and Indonesia aren't the only countries who've been accused of abusing Interpol systems. There are many other countries, too, under the spotlight. For example, Russia, Azerbaijan, Egypt. And take a look at this. A program broadcast on Uzbek TV. In it, an Uzbek Interpol official refers to Interpol red notices and to Alim Atayev and his daughter Nadejda. Both were granted asylum in France. At home with her father, Alim, Nadejda told us how the family had fled Uzbekistan after being charged with embezzlement when her father, Alim, spoke out against Uzbek authorities. Charges they dismiss as complete fiction. Но система, в которой, в той стране, где мы жили, в которой мы родились, в ней невозможно добиться справедливости. Моя история, она, к сожалению, не единственная. Таких тысячи. Nadezhda remained on the wanted list for many years. She said it restricted her ability to travel and to tell her story. И вот э, в путешествиях, в дороге, У меня случались случаи, когда меня задерживали именно потому, что я в списках Интерпола. So what can Interpol do to prevent abuse of its wanted alert systems? Interpol are at great pains to underline the neutrality of their organization, and they point to their constitution and Article 3. It is strictly forbidden for the organization to undertake any intervention or activities of a political, military, religious or racial character.
Interpol's imposing headquarters in Lyon, France. A team here checks countries' requests for wanted alerts to make sure they comply with Interpol's rules. But this is an organization with a complex legal status, which makes it very difficult to sue Interpol directly. All the more reason critics say that Interpol strengthens its systems. Interpol has to do a much tougher job at reviewing red notices, for example, before they're circulated. And it has to get used to saying no to member countries. It has to get used to saying to countries, you cannot use Interpol systems in this kind of politically motivated case. But I think it can be done, and I think Interpol has to do it to maintain its reputation. But whilst concerns have grown over checks on red notices, there's also concern over the other, less formal wanted alerts diffusion notices, which can be circulated directly to member countries using Interpol's systems. In 2011, international NGO workers left Egypt after being accused of operating illegally during the revolution. The charges were widely condemned as politically motivated, but some workers were given jail sentences in absentia. One of them was a US journalist and media consultant, Michelle Betts. Like her colleagues, Michelle discovered that the Egyptian authorities had found a way of pursuing her beyond their own borders. The method they chose was a diffusion notice. We spoke to Michelle on Skype. I had no idea what a diffusion was. How did you go about trying to find out about this diffusion notice and contacting Interpol about it? Well, boy, that was that's a story. I initially tried to call Interpol, and Interpol said, well, we, we don't speak to individuals. And I said, but I'm an individual that is apparently wanted by Interpol, and now you're saying you won't speak to me. No, ma'am, we won't speak to you. You need to contact um, you know, law enforcement in, in whatever country you're in. With little response in the US, Michelle's lawyer contacted an organization called the Commission for the Control of Interpol's Files. The CCF is an independent body responsible for processing requests for access to Interpol files as well as complaints. One issue that the grounds which a member state supplies to Interpol to justify the alert belong to a country's National Central Bureau and the Commission must ask for permission to release information. So when Michelle's lawyer asked about her diffusion notice, the Commission said to provide you with a useful answer would require that the Commission consult the country concerned. But they considered that, in the present case, the consultation of Egypt is not advisable. It's completely Kafkaesque. Then Interpol says, well, you know, we're still not going to give you any information about you unless you get approval, essentially, from Egypt, which is completely bizarre. And in the same breath, they're also saying, but we don't advise that you contact Egypt. So what am I supposed to do? After sustained pressure, the commission eventually informed Michelle that information about her had been deleted from Interpol's files. In Amsterdam, we were to meet another man who'd also encountered the Commission for the Control of Interpol's Files. In 2009, an Azerbaijani dissident went to meet his mother at Schiphol Airport. Azir Samadov had been an anti-government activist in Azerbaijan. But when several members of his movement were arrested, he had fled the country and ended up in the Netherlands, where he was granted refugee status. So when he was detained at Schiphol, he was taken completely by surprise. When we met Azir and his wife, they explained how Dutch authorities told Azir he'd been stopped on the basis of an Interpol wanted alert. The Dutch authorities eventually apologized for arresting Azir. But it was when he tried to find out what information Interpol held on him that things got even more complicated. His lawyer contacted the Commission for the Control of Interpol's Files. 
we heard almost six years later that the red notice had disappeared, but we didn't hear that from Interpol, we heard that from Dutch authorities, the Dutch Interpol representatives in the Netherlands who informed us that the red notice had been withdrawn. We have never had official confirmation. Worse, uh, Azerbaijan could put up a new red notice and we would not know. We asked him what he made of his experience with the Commission for the Control of Interpol's files. Oh, it's, it's completely ineffective. It's, it's, it's a joke. But the controversy over Interpol wanted alerts isn't the only issue which has called the organization's reputation into question. Another is funding. Who pays for all this? Interpol's member countries contribute varying sums towards an operating income in 2015 of over 113 million euros. But Interpol has also taken money from private donors. This is Interpol's additional funding document for 2015. And if we scroll down here, we find the contributions from private entities. One of them, a deal in 2011 with the international governing body of football, FIFA, earmarked for a project about integrity in sport. The deal, worth 20 million euros to Interpol, was announced with a fanfare, along with a photograph of the then Secretary General of Interpol, Ronald K. Noble, and the former president of FIFA, Sepp Blatter. But even back then, serious allegations of corruption were swirling around FIFA, and it was to get far worse. Swiss police have arrested six high-ranking officials of football's world governing body on suspicion of corruption. Two months later, Interpol terminated its agreement with FIFA and returned the 2.9 million euros, which remained unspent from the donation. Richard Murphy is a leading expert in international political economy. Interpol has to be seen to be completely independent. That's the basis on which law and order must be undertaken. And there's therefore this conflict between the promotion of the interests of the private sector organisation providing money and Interpol itself, which must be seen to be neutral. I don't believe that that is a circle that can be squared. What do you make of some of the past donations? For example, the donation of 20 million euros from FIFA. The timing of the FIFA donation to Interpol was quite extraordinary. In 2011, at the time that FIFA was really coming under significant international scrutiny and media scrutiny, frankly, I think law enforcement has to be funded by governments, has to be delivered by governments, has to be seen to be independent of risk in the private sector, where we simply don't know where the next prosecution is going to arise. Back in Bali, delegates were preparing to vote on reforms to answer critics' demands for more accountability, transparency and more rigorous scrutiny of wanted alerts. But discussion of this was strictly behind closed doors. Journalists were not allowed in. Instead, we were left surveying the sideshows, an exhibition of the latest in law enforcement kit and preparations for an evening performance by a group of police singers. Day three was billed as the moment we might get answers. Things started to move quickly. Delegates had approved changes, but would there be enough to satisfy the critics? One of the most important decisions concerned the powers of the Commission for the Control of Interpol's files. Measures Interpol maintained would better help individuals challenge information it may hold on them. We were given some papers and ushered up for an interview. So when we've literally only got this <laughs> in the last hour, and I do apologise, um, but I'm really keen to find out how long people have to wait. We wanted to find out what reforms the Assembly had agreed when it came to speeding up the process of complaining about notices once people found Interpol had data about them. The new rule is that this should take... Uh, be done within nine months. However, this is not, I must disappoint you, because there is a third paragraph to it, uh. saying that the request chamber may decide that the circumstances of a particular request warrant an extension of that time limit. The, the situation in the future will not be changed that much because the commission will always have to rely on the uh, 
uh, readiness of the NCBs to cooperate because according to this principle of national sovereignty, the national states or the national police bureaus, they uh, remain owners of that data. It seemed that at the heart of this then remained Interpol's relations with its member states and whether or not Interpol can prevent some countries from abusing their alert system. One of the questions we put in our interview with the Interpol Secretary General, Jürgen Stock. Do you accept that Interpol red notices and diffusions have been abused by member states to pursue, to persecute political dissidents and opponents? Let me start by saying we are facing globally um, a complex um, threat landscape, more international, more difficult um, than ever. We have to ensure as, as global law enforcement that uh, we don't see any safe havens for, for criminals, whether it's terrorist organized crime groups or whether it's cyber criminals. Of course, answering your, your question, um, every single case that might happen uh, where we identify non-compliance with our rule is one case uh, too many, no doubt about that. Last year, for instance, we've been publishing uh, on behalf of our member countries just around more than 10,000 uh, red notices. Only one to two percent um, have been, um, normally have been identified as being non-compliant. What about reviews of requests for red notices right from the start, preventing the damage before it starts? That, that's, a, that's a very good point. I mean, uh, what also, are you doing about that? A, a very good point you made, of course, that, that's a starting point. It's a request of a member country. Um, but are you reforming Coming into to the General Secretariat, and of course I invested a lot um, um, during the last uh, 24 months. I introduced a task force to even more intensively uh, review every single request that uh, comes in in uh, our General Secretariat, mainly in Lyon. But wouldn't it be more transparent if you said these countries are serial offenders when it comes to abusive requests for red notices and diffusions? Here are the countries, we're going to name and shame them, we're going to have sanctions against them, and if they continue with this, they're no longer going to be part of this very important global policing organisation. Our role is to help uh, member countries to develop this kind of, of legal process, to ensure the compliance with our rules and, and, and regulations. And this is what we are doing intensively. On, on, on many occasions, we have our regular meetings. You haven't answered my question, <laughs> though, with respect. You must know which countries are serial abusers of your own system. You if, must know if, that as Interpol. If, if you must have that information. If we identify non-compliance with uh, uh, our rules and regulations in the single case, of course we, repro we provide the feedback um, to the member country concerned. Can I just uh, pick up to you on something you were talking about this morning in your speech, when you were talking about improving the financial health of um, Interpol. Isn't there always going to be a conflict of interest when an organisation like Interpol accepts money from private organisations? We have been implementing a specific office and a due diligence officers, officer um, and a set of, of frame, a set of rules and regulations that is uh, guiding us. So it's a bad idea to take that donation from FIFA? wasn't it? Um, Highly embarrassing to the reputation of Interpol. I, I, I stopped that. Uh, I knew you stopped it. I've got, I've got your I, speech I, here I, saying you stopped I, it. I stopped yes. that. Um, yes. And, and of course... Um, it was compromising the core the values of Interpol. The membership was also... We had a, a, a working group um, on Interpol's evolving funding model and there was an overwhelming support amongst the membership to be, to be more careful, to have very strict rules um, uh, in, in process to establish a new process also of transparency so that Interpol's integrity, reputation and independence is not affected negatively. As the assembly came to an end and delegates left along with the Balinese security operation, Interpol insisted that the changes they agreed here will mean greater accountability, transparency and scrutiny of wanted alerts. But Interpol has not published full details of the changes and observers are waiting to see what impact they will have.